Hello and welcome to Roundtable, a series of conversations with CEOs, business owners and coffee leaders from the global coffee community. My name is Jan Sapostolopoulos and I'm the CEO of the Specialty Coffee Association. First, we want to thank our series sponsor, Stonebarista Attitude, a blend of craftsmanship and high technology. Stonebarista Attitude is designed for the most demanding and experimental baristas, offering total control of her brewing parameters. Learn more about it at stormbaristaattitude.com. I'd like also to take this opportunity to thank our sponsor for this episode, Saver Brands. Saver Brands continue to champion independent cafes, coffee roasters, and producers by helping them evolve with specialty coffee. United by Coffee, Saver Brand is there to support every step of the supply chain. So the coronavirus pandemic has brought the global economy to a halt having an immediate and long-term impact on specialty coffee business and professionals. What are businesses doing to survive in this time of crisis? What are the experience of those business owners and coffee leaders who had to shut down or reduce their operation? Are there opportunities to be seen in these dark times? These are all questions we seek to answer in honest conversations with dozens of leaders in the industry over the next few weeks. In this inaugural episode, I speak with four esteemed coffee professionals who share their experiences as owners of independent cafes amid this pandemic. We hope you enjoy this conversation. So hello everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, new series of webinars called The Roundtable where uh, we're gonna be bringing leaders uh, from the coffee industry around the world, trying to, uh, to go deep into how this uh, coronavirus crisis has uh, affected the industry. Uh, we're gonna be trying to get as much different perspectives as we have from different locations around the world, from leaders they are uh, experiencing that. And we were going to try to, to talk about the challenges, the experiences, and the opportunities they're facing during this crisis. We're going to try to identify uh, common patterns uh, around the world, but also what are the outliers that are outliers that has make a difference in uh, or a success story, or even uh, a story that wasn't successful, but we can all learn from that. Um, it's my honor and pleasure to to have this uh, first table that goes more into independent coffee shops and have people from all around the world. I would like to welcome Pamela Chang uh, from Better Barista in Singapore, Hannah Chapsman uh, from Flip Coffee, the founder and CEO of Flip, Co Flip Coffee in Moscow, and the co-owners of uh, Wrecking Ball, Nick Cho and Tris uh, Rothkip. So welcome everybody. It's really a pleasure to have you uh, today on this panel. Uh, I want to start, um, I'm gonna go with Pam first. Um, Pamela, uh, I would like to ask you, you're in Singapore. Singapore is ahead of the rest of the world in how it experiences uh, that uh, crisis. Um, we both and all understand it's not just a healthcare crisis, it's also a significant uh, economic crisis that affects uh, small, medium business, especially independent coffee shops. And I would like to know uh, from your perspective, uh, what has been the challenges that uh, you have faced till today? Uh, thanks, Janice. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, you're right. We, we did kind of get um, the first wave of things pretty early on. I think actually at the end of January, uh, we started to have to react uh, to the situation. Um, and uh, I, I think I remember actually in February already, uh, we, we started to start having measures and that were starting to affect business already. Like, for example, all events uh, being cancelled. Um, and we know the impact of events being cancelled, right? Because uh, you know, even the SCA has had to deal with that. Um, and I think uh, it was really just, I think the past kind of, well, I don't know, um, two and a half months 
it's just been actually a cycle uh, of, of moving through the, the various stages of what's been happening. So I think like what's happening in maybe US and Europe, in Europe um, maybe we dealt with it in the first wave for us, which was probably in March. Um, and uh, in terms of just affecting operations, um, we've just basically slowly had to shut more and more aspects of the business, right? Uh, as the measures tightened. Uh, here in Singapore, and uh, I mean, at this point, we're probably down revenue probably 70%. Um, uh, and just yesterday, we had to close the last of our, our retail shops uh, because they had they basically closed all non-essential businesses, and um, standalone coffee shops were classified as generally non-essential. Um, if you didn't serve hot food, <laughs> uh, and so I think we've just basically uh, had to scramble a little bit and work through um, how to deliver products to people online right um, as well as think of innovative ways of uh, continuing to serve people their coffee uh, so for example uh, last uh, two weeks ago we decided to do a drink subscription we made coffee fresh and we delivered it to people's homes right uh, and then with the new measures two weeks later we had to stop that so i think i think all of us in our ways of trying to cope uh, and keep revenue coming in and keep uh, jobs, right, uh, of our people. Uh, it's how do we just keep the, the, the money flowing in as, as much as we can to, to sustain and ride out um, what is probably going to be many, many more months of this. So um, you were saying it's the, the, the kind of the second wave. So yeah. if I understood well, were you forced to shut down during the first wave or it's just the first time that uh, the businesses are forced to shut down correct so i think in asia the trajectory was is a, has been a little bit different um a lot of uh the countries here in this part of the world i think we've kept open for much longer um and uh because there was a lot of aggressive um tracing, tracking, and, and, and treatments uh, going on. Uh, we were trying to keep business as usual for longer. So in a way, we didn't have to deal with the challenges of just completely shutting down overnight, but it has been challenging because you're having to cope on a weekly basis. Something changes, uh, you know, you have to adapt. Um, and I think when you're trying to do that as an organization, as a team, um, a lot of things come into play because you have to manage not just the business but the people, right? And that's the most important part. You have to manage their safety, their health, and then their mental and emotional state. Um, so I think for a lot of business owners, that is, I think, a major uh, focus, right? To, 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 to care about our staff and our people, right, in, in this situation. I see. Um, um, if I go to to you, Nick, and, and Chris, um, uh, the US uh, was one of the last countries that uh, that felt uh, the, the effect of this pandemic. Um, how uh, did this affect your business? And where do you find, I would say, similarities to what Pam was describing? Because being myself here in the US, I realized that um, coffee shops one way or the, or the other even though they they are considered essential business um they some of them they were forced to shut down because of their location because of uh, their operation model so i think it's I like mostly hear... because of location i think that location for us is we've been we've been fortunate because we're in the san francisco bay area and the United States is a big place, as we all know. It's a it's a it's a bigger place than people realize if they've never been here, they don't they don't understand. But San Francisco Bay Area and California was very proactive. That's one of the things that we wanted to mention. Um so we are we're fortunate also because our shops, we have two, are mostly in neighborhoods. So um that kind of forward thinking of the community of the our leadership here in our specific like san francisco bay area as well as location has uh made a difference for us in a lot of ways it feels like one of those movies where there's an alternate universe right it's like every all the buildings look the same the sky looks the same the mountains look the same but the good location and bad locations are all of a sudden flipped 
you know the places where the downtown like really busy locations all of a sudden are the worst locations it just feels like yeah like <laughs> bizarre world where everything is different um and even again you know we're sort of the representatives of the u.s market here san francisco is very different from new york city uh you know all the whole geography i think the way that that has has uh changed in every day every couple days seems like a new situation pam was mentioning that you know this second wave situation so all of a sudden compared to two days ago like it's a different market that we're dealing with and so um and also uh the mayor of san francisco uh reminded all of us at the beginning of this Mayor London Breed, that San Francisco had the epidemic of AIDS in the 80s and learned a lot from that. And so the community here is like very, uh, with the exception of the new people that have moved in here since, are, uh, that's it. it's, it's just the culture. The, it's the legacy and the culture of San Francisco to sort of get onto these things and pay attention to the science. Yeah. Um, Anna, you are in Moscow. You are on, on your closed coffee shop at the moment. Uh, so uh, Russia has been one of the countries that uh, that was uh, keeping the statistics down uh, for a long period of time in Europe. And I don't know if that was because of political reasons of, or it was the reality. But I guess uh, that um, uh, for the the last month, Europe has been, uh, until very recently, where U.S. start picking up, has been the epicenter of uh, of this epidemic. And I would like to understand, Russia um, uh, sat down early and uh, they they took uh, aggressive measures, but I don't know if this is paying off and and how has affected your business there. So if you can share with us that experience. Well, um, we were lucky to open our first coffee shop in January, this January, and the next four we opened till March. So we were trying <laughs> to starting, and so we don't have like loyal customers, you know, people who've known us for like 10 years that love us and want to get our coffee and not someone else's. So we were just at the beginning of the whole thing, and then, uh, and Russia was treating this new COVID as a you know general flu. No one was worried at all, and still most of the people are worried. I can tell. We still think that it's not that bad actually. Uh, but um, uh, close to the mid of March, we started to slow down um, restaurants and having us to. Try start thinking about closing things, and um, they had some restrictions on people uh, that had to stay home, and there be all that thing with them that you have to stay home, stay away from everyone. And the sales started going a little bit down, but still we were doing very good. And uh, then close to the end of March, they just closed everyone. We still can uh, take away, but. Uh, if you are looking at the numbers, takeaway take away will not cover the rent and the salaries and anything. So because there are not so much people on the streets now, because now we have to be at home and you can only be on the street to have a reason or if you have to work. So we we just launched the delivery of the beans and tea. Uh, that's basically all we are doing. And um, since in Russia you cannot fire people, not like in United States, for example, you can just say goodbye, but in Russia you cannot, and it's um, against the law. So you have to pay all the sal salaries even if you are closed, both to the office and to people who work for you. So, yeah, so we are spending our money just on salaries now, and because our um, um, Companies who rent uh, the properties for us, they went for zero rent, so we are pretty pretty safe on that. So we're not spending time on milk, you know, on anything, just salaries. And also, we might uh, get a tax relief, but I'm not sure we'll get that because you know, one thing is that something is being promised. The other thing that <laughs> you actually get from the government in Russia, usually you don't get anything. So. Yeah, so that's what we're doing, spending money and enjoying the sun. 
So taking from uh, where Anna, um, uh, how Anna positioned the, the situation in Russia, I would like to ask you all the same, because um, I heard from Pamela, I heard from Nick, I heard from Anna, that you were all experimenting with different operational models. And I think you're doing that in order, first of all, to, to adapt to the new reality, but also it has to do with the financial viability of the organization, how your internal and external stakeholders are being impacted uh, uh, by meaning uh, employees, investors, uh, if you have some investors, uh, and also uh, real estate and vendors, uh, and how do you manage with payments and uh, of suppliers, so I think this is uh, an interesting part because we've heard from Anna, like in Russia, you don't have a rent. I know in the US and uh, and in Singapore, uh, real estate is super expensive. And and we know that we are mostly uh, as as a business uh, contributing significant part of, of our uh, revenues towards rent. Uh, no, we usually, Yanis, Yanis. No, no, we usually do rent, but for this quarantine thing, we uh, negotiated a zero rent. That's a different story. Yes, which, which shows though a mentality in Russia, which is not like what I was saying. It's, I, I don't think it's something that it's uh, common with, with the US. Uh, on the other hand, in Russia, um, you're not allowed by the law to let people go or to furlough people, which in the US, it has been a different story. And we know the stories in the US. I don't know, Pamela, how does this reflect in Singapore? So let me start doing a reverse, uh, let's say, round here. I would like to start with uh, Tris and, and Nick to understand how this whole uh, situation has impacted those relationships uh, and, uh, and your financial viability as well. Yeah, the um, I mean, let's start with landlords. You know, for us, we have we've had historically good relationships with our landlords, and when we asked for some help in this regard, uh, they all three of them. I don't know if it was a coincidence or not. They all responded with the same thing, which is pay half your rent now, and then the other second half you owe someday. You know, maybe next year, maybe later this year. And for us, we felt like saying, uh, you think that's generous, you know, our business is not our business, but a lot of businesses are closed. You know, our cafes are open, but our wholesale business is down and we were looking for whatever help we can get uh, to sort of make sure that, you know, to ensure the viability of our business. Uh, we don't want to just go into like a suspended hibernation and see if we can come out the other end and survive. And so it, it was a little bit upsetting, frankly, like emotionally, to feel like the landlords wanted to make sure that eventually they would be made whole and get 100% of their revenue when we have none of those assurances. Um, so even when people say, we're all in this together, you know, this is the time when you prove that you actually mean that. Um, Trish can speak a little bit about green coffee importer experiences because that's a reality for a small roaster like us too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does make it feel like the roaster retailer is sort of squeezed on both sides. I feel like probably everybody can say they, they have that feeling. We have the responsibility we really feel to the, our employees, and then we have um, our vendors and our landlords. So we are we feel as if we're the ones in, in the middle of those things because, you know, our first priority is make sure that we're taking care of our uh, employees and we've retained all of them. We've been lucky enough. When it comes to vendors, um, yeah, it's, it's difficult. And the more difficult of a conversation I have with any of, of them, I've just you know made, the, made a personal agreement that I'm gonna reach out to all of, our, all of our customers that we love and just tell them that we really love love you we know you've closed down and you can't pay past due but like can't wait till you come back or please keep us posted like and they don't trust they sometimes don't trust me when i call them they all they think i'm bugging them for for money because all of their vendors are bugging them for money and i really just want to say hey uh we you know at wrecking ball we know you can't pay your your bill <laughs> 
um, we're, we're watching you, we're, we're rooting for you, and, and uh, that's all I can do because on the other side, the, the green coffee has to, you know, people have to do what they have to do. Um, we're concerned that our milk vendor, vendor is viable. You know, they've come down, like we're actually worried about people going out of business. I don't know um, how much of these multinational green coffee importers are really threatened at this point in the short term. I wonder if they couldn't be a little bit more sort of, even in their messaging, you know, maybe it's not that they can do anything for us, but uh, there is something to be said for being a little bit understanding in your communication and i've i see really very very little yeah some of the that. importers have re have reached out and basically their message seems to be uh pay your bills because we don't know if you're going to be alive in a month so we are going to get all the money from you that we can for now so trish was telling me it feels like a vampire is waiting <laughs> at the hospital you might die so can i have your blood you know before you die it, i mean there have been literal <laughs> conversations like that uh i shouldn't say plural there was there was one conversation like that where but other the, people have been saying the been, person yeah. is like yeah give me all my money now and i'll bug you and i don't know what the point is it's almost like you know now i don't want to go on a rant about it i feel like i'm about <laughs> to go on a rant but the idea that uh when people say we're in this together i think nick and i really want to make that point to our uh even if we have customers that never come back because they have to close down, we don't know if they'll find a way in a year to open another spot, but also we really want to be partners to them and we want to, it's all we can do is reach out to them and tell you, hey, hey, we really appreciate you. We can't wait to see you come back. You know, let us know what we can do for you. It's all we can do on our side. It's really interesting. And I wonder if this um, green uh, coffee vendors of yours they are they want to get their money because they want to pay their uh their farmers as well like i, I would course. like to see how this translates to the other end of the supply chain um this is an interesting um point there because um i think there is uh, the two weakest part on any crisis of, a, of any supply chain are the two ends of the supply chain and in our side it's the small businesses and baristas Pickers, farmers, I think they are that they would have to sustain the most stress out of this situation. Pamela, does any of this resonate with you and how? Um, yeah, I, I think I think some of it, because I, I think, you know, Singapore is also like, you know, a city, right? Uh rich city. Um, but I think I think one thing I have to say is that our government, our government has really stepped up uh in terms of supporting businesses like um you know i mean they've mandated a lot of closures of business but you know they've they're paying 75 percent of every uh, people's salaries uh during this period um which i think really helps to keep a lot of small businesses going uh because their mandate is don't let people go right let everybody keep their jobs our goal is to ride this out with jobs intact because People need the jobs, right? Um, so, so I think in terms of of um, just the government support as a stakeholder, I think they're doing their best um, to keep businesses and the economy going. Uh, so I think that's that's very important. Um, to um, so landlords, um, I, I can't speak for the whole uh, for the whole uh, sector, but I, I can. We we have been very lucky because we have. Um, I think quite special relationships with a lot of our um, our landlords with our retail outlets. Um, but I, I I know that some many actually uh, are in like big business landlord um, situations and yeah, it's tough. Uh, it's it's really tough and rents are really high here. Um, so I I think again everybody's just hanging on because there's not much you can do, <laughs> uh, you know, when you're faced with with the big guys um, and with supplies and all that. I mean I think the green coffee, um, what Trish was talking about, um, again I think we're we're still okay here uh, because we're we're quite a large trade hub. Uh, so I think there's still a lot of coffee in Moon Tree that's here. So. Um, yeah being able to cope with that, I think has been okay, but I do worry about the impact of um, all of that 
at, at the farmer level and whether they're getting paid fairly. And I think this is where the big business uh, in coffee, especially, they really need to step up uh, because if, if anybody needs you now, it's, it's, I mean, if anybody needs you, it's now, right? Uh, and and uh, even a little bit is going to go a long way um, for either end, right? Um, so so that I think I, I, I agree with, with what Trisha and Nick is saying is just, I, I would like to see more voices coming out um, to, to you know, put the money where their mouth is and go, how can we ride through this as an industry uh, together, you know, because, you know, if all the shops fall, that's it. That's going to be a domino effect, you know, down the line. Um, and then for employees, I, vendors, well, you know, we're not chasing people and lucky people are not chasing us. So that's a good thing. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's this, you know, like everybody's in it together. So I give you some, you give me some, and hopefully we can get to the finish line together. You know, I think, um, so in, in, I feel like right now we're okay in that sense. Um, but yeah, I, I think the big businesses who can afford it, they, they should step up right now. So I I understand the 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 challenges and and how this whole environment has has uh, has shifted. Um, I always have this question because um, uh, for me, unfortunately, it's the second similar crisis that I live. I had to the unpleasant uh, experience of Greece in 2015, where GDP was down by 10% and unemployment skyrocketed in 30%. Um, and it was challenging for me uh, back then, uh, trying to to uh, to navigate a business. It's still challenging on the SEA, but um, I would like to hear personally for you as as business owners or as, as coffee, I would say leaders in your uh, uh, environments like, how do you experience that personally? Uh, I can imagine from first hand it's been really tough. So I would like to start with uh, Chris and Nick this time. Like, how do you uh, feel about this, and how difficult has it been for you as as uh, as a couple as well? Because you're you're a couple and you are owning one business, and it's you have all the the eggs in one basket, as as we say. Um, that's a great question. Thanks, thanks for that. I, I think that um, things are changing so quickly, and every couple of days, you know, it's a, it's sometimes a new reality, and it many ways feels like you know walking down the street, and like I keep using these movie feel. This feels like a movie, right? Whatever what we're going through, and it, and now if some you know. To answer your question, it feels like those movies like Inception where like you're walking and the sidewalk changes and in front of you and you have to figure out how to, you know, defeat your enemy or whatever, you know, through the process. Um, I think that... That and the overarching idea of the invisible threat. Right. That at any time when Nick leaves the house to go do an errand for the cafe, that's a vector. That's right. an issue. Right. Like a very real it's invisible threat constantly. Uh, mortality yeah. issue. Yeah. But you know, it, it um I think that it's made me personally really reflect a lot on kind of what it means to be I mean, it sounds kind of corny, but like what specialty means in the term specialty coffee. That um, you know, Trish and I have been around for a long time, and in many ways, like toward the beginning of the sort of third wave uh, uh, sector for specialty coffee, and so we very much remember what it was like to be um, one of one of like very few in the country that were looking at coffee the way that we were, that were talking about coffee and marketing coffee the way that we were, and so in many ways, like this has really reminded me a lot of those days like 2001, 2002. Um, and a lot of my emotions have been similar where it feels like, what am I doing? Like I'm taking this risk, this unproven thing that is new. Um, it feels right. It feels like the right thing to do. But there's a lot of people around me that are telling me I'm doing the wrong thing, that that will never work. 
Um, you know, things like that, a lot of doubt uh, and, and those kind of conflicted feelings, like those are all kind of coming back to me 20 years later and realizing that, you know, I'm a, 20 years older than I was when I started my coffee company, my first coffee company, but feeling and re remembering, like, actually, I know how to do this. Like, I know how to navigate a situation where there's a lot of uncertainty and things, you know, everything feels new. Um, and, you know, for both of us, I think, like, really tapping into that and counting on the idea that as, as leaders of our companies, as well as, you know, to some degree in the industry, that, um, you know, there, there are some muscles maybe we haven't used in a while, but they're still there. Can I ask you the following, though, because um, it's really interesting. But 20 years ago, it wasn't that you had so many employees to, to take care of. You didn't have to care about your family and maybe other families or other individuals. And I think um, 20 years after and, and being who you are today, both of you, uh, uh, I think it's a bit different. That burden, I think it's, it's the, the main burden that uh, everyone carries um, with, with the years. I would say of of doing that business, and how does that change that feeling of? Uh, but also, twenty years ago, we didn't have teenage children at home. You know, <laughs> yeah. In many ways, I think that that evolution in our own lives it it kind of goes hand in hand. You know, it's our employees are not our children, but they are our responsibility. And so, you know, I feel like that's. As much as we're tapping into muscles that we haven't used in 20 years, we are also using the muscles that we've developed over the last 20 years also. You know, it's a thing that I, when I look into uh, into my mother's eyes, my mother who turns 80 this year, um, when you come to her with your problems at age, I'm age 53, but I remember when I'd come to her with my problems at age 36 or whatever, whatever, she just had this, uh, you know, I'm lucky to have the mom I have, just to look at me and almost without saying it, like, yeah, this is, life's gonna throw you some stuff, you know? And she would just like listen, but you could tell she wasn't really listening because it's like she had already been through it. And I feel that way sometimes when I look at, when I have a conversation with my roasters or something and they're telling me they're worried about this and that. And it is true, we have not ever gone through this before. It's unprecedented worldwide, but, there's also a thing where I'm like, well, you know, this is what's happening right now. And we're just going to do the next hour. And then we're going to do the next hour. Then we're going to see if we get orders tomorrow that we have to roast. And then we're going to do that. And so I feel like uh, that's what I can bring is I've been through a lot of stuff. Giannis, you've been through that ish situation in Greece. We went through all kinds of things. Never been like this before brand new for everybody, tragic for everybody, but, uh, you know, what's the next thing? Just do the next thing, just do the next thing and move, move forward. I, uh, yeah, I hear you. Uh, Anna, going to you, <laughs> like you decided to, uh, to go back to startup, to, to go back from, from scratch, scratch, on, on a period of time that you didn't expect that things are gonna turn out this way. So how does it feel to be back on, on square one at this very moment uh, when you were planning to, to grow, when you were planning to invest? Like, how does this feel uh, personally at this moment? Well, uh, we've been through this several times in 1999, 8, 1998, then 2007, then 2014. You know, we, we know how to start from scratch. So I think it's a good time for us as businessmen to reflect on what we are doing. What are the real goals? What is our business? Uh, what will be in the future? How are we ready to change? Because I really think that the most successful businesses are not the ones that are, you know, made out of stone, you know, and that stand on pillars the same all over, uh, but only businesses who are willing to change every day. It's like the environment changes, the customers change, you know, the new coffee shops are opening, new roasteries are coming up, uh, different challenges, different 
you know, like this influenza, whatever is happening, <laughs> just came and locked down, everyone down. So, but we know for sure we'll be out, right? We know for sure there will be new customers with much less money than they had before all over the world. We know that um, there's going to be big changes in economics all over the world that we cannot travel, you know, we cannot, uh, uh, we don't want to spend a lot of money, right? Because we are not certain about the future. But we know that um, it's still business environment. If we are in business, we have to rethink constantly on what are we doing, where are we going? Maybe we have to change the concept a little bit. Maybe we have to be more open to digital because most of the businessmen, you know, we look at digital as like 10% or, you know, 12% of our business, usually like offline business and then it's okay. Um, and, but companies who know how to work online, they have that advantage, even though they are low in sales as well now, because, you know, expensive coffee is, you know, different business and we don't know what future holds for us. But I do believe that uh, the market that's grown and people who love good coffee and who would not, you know, go down in coffee quality will still search for opportunity to have money, you know, to to still drink coffee, maybe at home, maybe not in the coffee shop. Uh, we still don't know how the new tendency will affect um, guests. Maybe they will not be eager to spend time in coffee shops. Maybe we'll, they will turn into takeaway. Or it will be vice versa and people will be so, you know, <laughs> happy to be again to back to normal life that they will spend more time in coffee shops. We don't know if people will go to distance uh, work, right? Maybe they will not work from offices or they will work from offices. We all don't know for sure, but it's time to think of different strategies, different products that we can offer and mm, be willing to, to change it. If we are in business, we have to know how to still earn money. But for now, we have to fix that we're gonna spend, you know, you have to invest and we'll never get this money back. And also with the landlords, uh, there's another thing, you know, we've started the conversations at the end of February and only by the end of March, we could reach uh, uh, the right um, conditions for us. And, um, and the landlords in March are not the, the landlords in May when they will also be affected by all that. And maybe it's going to be easier to talk to them again, just you know, keep talking to them and asking and discussing and not postponing the rent, but trying to get it out for this period. So how does all this is affecting you as Anna? Like, is Anna still having like the stamina and the strength to, to cope with all this? Like, oh, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, because, uh, you know, my personality is not built on my business. You know that very well, Yanis, right? <laughs> I'm very, I, I take that very separate business and personal. And my personal life is based on so different things and it's so stable and it's, um, I'm even enjoying it because I have uh, more time for things that I like to do and, but I still go to work. So I still have to spend some time for work in this uh, pandemia or whatever that is. So no, I'm, I'm feeling pretty confident and um, I know that um, we'll come out stronger and maybe with different new ideas and we now have time to implement them. So it's a good time. So going to Pamela, Pamela, your business is a social business and a social business we always know has a personal toll as well there because yeah. it's, it's not just uh, 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 a business that focuses on on return on investment and stuff like that it has a personal toll because uh, there is more to care about than just yeah. uh, what is uh, outside the cup I would say yeah. so how does uh, all this has saved you as a, as a, as a leader of the yeah. personality over the last couple of months no, I mean, I, I love listening to, you know, the rest of you guys, because I think it really epitomizes the idea of the entrepreneur and, and kind of the characteristics of what, you know, I think as a business owner and somebody who starts a business, these are all the things that will um, take you through crisis moments like this, right? Uh, this idea of um, that, you know, any 
crisis is an opportunity, right? Um, to do things different, to do things better, to reevaluate um, the purpose of what you do. Um, and, and for those of us, I think, who can take that lesson on, it's very valuable, right? Because you come out of this stronger, for sure. Um, and, you know, as, as Trish said, you know, life throws you stuff all the time. You know, it's, yes, this, this stuff is bigger than usual, I think. Um, you know, but history of civilization and humanity, we will come out of this in some shape and form. We don't know what that looks like, but you know, if we if we work towards the fundamentals, um, we can come out of this, I think, better. Um, so for me, I think personally, the leadership of an organization is very important that you take care of yourself because if you're not taking care of yourself, you can't take care of your people, right? So, and I'm talking about physical health and mental and emotional health, right? Um, and, and recognizing in moments of crisis, what you need help with and what you can give as well, right? Um, so, so I take strength, I guess, in the low moments, because, you know, trust me, I've had my depressive moments, uh, you know, uh, when I realized that, okay, you know, this thing is not gonna disappear by June, uh, you know, we're probably June 2022 or something, right? Uh, but I think once you allow yourself to, to accept, right? Uh, Anna's laughing. Uh, once you once you kind of allow yourself to accept that this is the new reality, then then I guess the entrepreneur's mind kicks in and goes, okay, this is the reality. What do we need to do to innovate, to change, to ensure that we we, we live to tomorrow and 2022? Um, and then that's I think then looking at the purpose of what we do, right? Which is what you're talking about, Yannis, and for us uh, as a social business um, that you know, that purpose is, is uh, there are a lot of lives in terms of like the marginalized communities that we work with that are directly impacted by the work that we do, right? So we need to find a way, we must find a way to be around for them, um, you know? Um, so that kind of gives me that push, right? And that energy to say, uh, you know, you know, kind of get, get the team together and go, guys, remember why we're here doing what we're doing, right? And um, take energy from that, right? And focus on like what you said day after day. What do we need to get done today, tomorrow? And then eventually the sun will shine again, right? Uh, so it's just taking control of what you can control. I think that's a very important thing and keeping the, the team focused. Um, that's our job, I think, as leaders is to, is to be clear uh, to be honest, right? To recognize that it is scary times for a lot of people and not to dismiss that and to actually, you know, be there for them um, because that's the role of a leader, right? Um, uh, and, and, and yeah, so so I've, I've gone through my, you know, depressive moment. I'm ready to go again, uh, you know, and, and I think that's, that's what I think will get the successful businesses out of the situation, right? It's, it's really a mindset. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. I think uh, what you identify there, like being honest, transparent, vulnerable, it's something that it, it's really important uh, to, to drive and to, to lead any team, uh, no matter what. Um, but you said something there that um, um, I want to bring to this conversation because I think it's important. Uh, you said that, um, Every crisis brings opportunities, and we we've heard that again and again. And I want to to start with you asking, like, where did you see opportunities within this crisis? Like, what things um, uh, worked or didn't work for you that you thought they were opportunities? Because I think it's important for us to share that uh, with the community and try to 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 bring that to to other people, because there are a lot of similar businesses that are struggling around the world. And I think we can we can be searching for those opportunities. Yeah, I mean, very quickly, I think like we run an academy as well, right? Um, and, and that one has been a huge pivot. Uh, so you know, the team has been hustling the past you know, two months and we're taking uh, all the SCA foundation classes online, uh, you know, doing blended learning. Um, uh, to, to, to be able to ensure that we can still deliver education uh, in this new world, right? 
Um, and I think that's an opportunity for a lot of um, like the, the educators in, in coffee to think about how do we use this technology and, and the virtual world to, to still share our love of, of the industry, right, and, and coffee. Um, uh, I think for the online channel that Anna was talking about, I think that is undoubtedly the, the, the channel that every business, uh, if you weren't paying attention to it before, you're going to be paying attention to, to it now. There's absolutely no choice about it. Um, so kind of really investing in the teams that can deal with delivering, uh, you know, online and, and dealing with your customers buying online, right? Whatever shape and form that is. I mean, you know, uh, like I said, you know, two weeks ago, we were, you know, getting people to subscribe to fresh drinks delivered to their homes, right? Uh, and the, whole, the team was innovating about how do we keep the drink quality for 30 minutes, you know, so that when it reaches the, 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 the person's house, um, they can still enjoy that cup as if the barista was right in front of them, you know, um, and, and, you know, uh, and innovating logistics, you know, um, thinking about how you can expand the skill set of your team as well to, to handle these new things, right? Learning online things. Um, and, uh, and the third thing I think is the mental and emotional component of the work. I think a lot of our baristas have to deal with that, uh, with the, the safety issues of customer service as well. Um, and I think we've done a lot of work on that one. And I think we're, we, you know, are starting a, a, a new arm just to deal with mental emotional wellness um, out of this, you know. Um, so yeah, so really going like anything goes right now because what's the worst can happen? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> we're we're not in a great situation. So <laughs> this is the time to try anything, right? And if it doesn't work, we'll move on because you know, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> it's just literally. <laughs> I was really yeah, interested about the... Go ahead, Nick, sorry. Uh, yeah, I just, you know, Pam, I, that reminds me, I mean, in a lot of times when we have these conversations like this during during this pandemic, you know, we, we can, sometimes it's it ends up being like, everyone knows, like everyone in coffee right now knows like delivery, online, you know, sales, like, you know, things like that. I know that for myself, when I think about the opportunity, you know, it, this is like a CEO round table. So, so uh, ideas and things are good. Um, a lot of it is also, um, a lot of self-examination, you know, is, is I think sometimes uh, for people like us, we're afraid to open up necessarily. I think, you know, having Trish in my life and being uh, partners in business and in life helps a lot to always have like a mirror around for both of us that's constantly reflecting back. And mm -hmm. so I know that for myself, it's really been making me take stock. In a way, it's like, as this has happened, we are sometimes literally and figuratively like looking at our inventory like what do we have what resources do we have what how much cash do we have like all that sort of stuff but there's also the difficult examination that we all hate to do of examining ourselves and the inventory of like what do we have inside of here do do i have creativity do i have innovation do i have um maybe the most important thing do i have trust that i have built up over years with our employees, with our community, with our stakeholders, you know, what is the nature of that trust? And in many ways, um, this whole thing has, as we've been talking, Trish and I talked to a lot of business owners all over the country and around the world during this time, just to sort of be able to share and be there for each other and support and realizing that, you know, different people have different assets in that way to tap into. And in many ways, I think that when you look at that, uh, that box of trust with your employees and you realize, oh, it's empty. I never spent much time building trust with my employees. Um, it shows now because you have nothing to tap into. You know, if, if someone asked us recently about how we've been able to retain all of our employees when for a lot of other shops, even in San Francisco, people have left because they don't want to work. They don't feel safe at work, but we've somehow been able to make everyone feel safe. We've had a few people who have left on their own just temporarily. But you know, the vast majority have stayed and they asked like, how did, how did we do that? And I didn't know how to answer that question because it's not a technique, it's not a trick uh, or something that we told them. It's years of built up trust 
to where they looked to us for leadership. And when we said, we're going to make this work, they believed us. And the other thing is we have to keep on looking at that every day and assessing it Yeah. because of the outside threats that we don't have control over. You know, anybody could, and it hasn't happened yet, but anyone could get sick. And then that whole shop doesn't trust anything all of a sudden overnight. It's different for them. So that could happen. It could happen that somebody's relative gets sick. It could happen that somebody thinks somebody isn't following the rules. And and then you have, and something that happened recently for me is, do, am I exuding enough empathy? <laughs> do, does that seem like, am, am I trying to look too tough and like too strong? for them that it ends up looking like I'm not, I don't care what they're going through. It's just so layered in that way. So like every opportunity to sort of like really assess yourself it, uh, comes into play. Yeah, for a lot of people, this situation may teach you, you shouldn't run a business. You don't deserve to have employees because you don't know how to take care of them. You know, that's a tough message to hear but you know it's it's true and in many ways um i think especially in specialty coffee this this is a burgeoning sort of growth industry growth sector and for a lot of people you know have been doing a lot of work trying to build uh that industry for a lot of people it's been an opportunistic thing where they've been able to kind of slide in and and pretend to be you know you know they look at all the Things you're supposed to do to do specialty coffee and they just check all the boxes but there's something that's missing in in the way that they're approaching business the way the way they're approaching relationships and this is revealing a lot of that and so you know this as we've all learned through this it's not just about money it's not just about access to capital it's not just about business acumen it's really about all the things like you have to be a well-rounded entrepreneur and business owner yeah I, I think what you're saying there, Nick, uh, also goes to the very start of how you build your business. And I think it's also to the fundamentals of how do you recruit your team? And I think the, the amount of, uh, of, of small businesses that usually what we're going to figure out uh, is, or it has been proven again and again, is that the amount that you spend to recruit your team or to dedicate to recruit the right people to your team pays out on, on these type of situations. And it's not just the leadership that you exercise on every day on how you take care of them. It's, it starts from the very beginning. And for some people uh, on both ends of the supply chain, just getting people to do the job is, is, is a very difficult thing. Getting the right people to do the job has been, is a completely different approach. And, and that pays off now, I guess. Um, I want to go back a bit to the business though perspective because I because uh, Pam was saying about the the fresh drinks delivery and the subscriptions. I've never heard about of subscriptions on French drink, fresh drinks delivery. I knew that you order and you get a delivery. Uh, uh, something which is very very, for example, where I come from in Greece, like ninety percent of the business is either uh to go or uh there is a lot of delivery in the coffee business or or what used to be a very um developed uh part of the business um but i heard that you set it that whole thing up and then you had to set it down because uh of restrictions uh so hearing all that do you do you feel that in the future that would be a significant revenue stream for you like it's gonna come back and it's and you're gonna activate it again uh when time's allowed and it's gonna be something i would say a different approach to innovate um, um i don't i'm not sure yet <laughs> there's still things to work out but i think it's not the it's not the end point i think the process was the point the process of learning about what worked what didn't work i think that's the value in the lesson uh uh on on thinking about what the eventual product would look like you know I, I think that whole area of things is is going to see a lot of innovation in the months to come because people are, are forced right to look at new ways of operating and existing um but but yeah I, I, that's why in a way i i i am mm, quietly 
excited about what the future holds because this is a time where I think we're going to see a lot of interesting innovations from people um and 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 that we can learn from you know uh and and yep. and uh so yeah i mean i'm i'm still we're, we're still processing that whole thing but you know now at least i have a team who knows how to do it from start to end um exactly. and that's that and that's the valuable thing right um we don't we're not going to get it perfect the first time uh but that's why the whole i feel like i'm starting up all over again you know like 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 a startup founder um which is like what nick was saying right those muscles that were built uh back then have now come into play uh, and they're aching a little bit but it's a good kind of ache <laughs> you know um yeah. yeah so nick um and going to anna um uh, led to anna at the end but i want to ask me because i i was following him on social media and i saw that you transform your subs to um uh, to go subs uh within days uh uh i don't know how this has been working i heard you talking the other day to peter about it um would you like to share more about that and do, do you see any opportunities coming out of that for the future yeah you know um like a lot of places i think that this whole virus situation kind of crept up at first like little steps and then all of a sudden like a big thing right and so um, for us, we started hearing, you know, as we were starting to hear, you know, this was a danger, um, the first sort of le like lowest level for shops in the US and I'm sure other places too was um, with the, people stopped accepting uh, people bring their own cup to the cafe and then serving the co coffee uh, or a drink in there. And so we saw this happening and then I looked at the situation, actually we were late to that some of the other larger companies did that first and then i i noticed it on social media and thought like oh okay this is that's a good idea this is serious like what else can we do and so we started implementing other things like uh i got these wax paper disposable wax paper squares that the customers can use to wrap their finger in before they use the touch screen when they when they pay you know um and then right away I started looking around and thinking, trying to think ahead. What if this gets more serious? What are the other things that we would do? What would represent escalation um, for the cafe? And I realized, well, you know, it's not ideal, but we could move the entire cafe service part to the front door. So we're only serving out the front door and customers are on the street. So, you know, I've been running cafes, open cafes and four or five different cities now. I know that's actually against the rules for health, the health department, that they don't think it's safe for, you know, you have to have, there's regulations about the way that the kitchen and There's areas, regulations for window service yeah. right onto the sidewalk. Okay. But, I, but I thought like, but if it gets more serious, then those regulations aren't gonna actually represent the highest degree of safety. And so um, we actually had a, a baristas who were, expressed to us they were very scared when the bay area san francisco bay area the government announced that they were going to do shelter in place kind of like lockdown where only essential businesses now we're considered essential business being food and beverage for now but um i so overnight actually i went to the stores and got all the the pieces together to to move everything to the front uh for our san francisco store and then we did the berkeley store right afterwards um so like, you know, in that situation, it was really like thinking about, again, like a little bit tapping back into like, what does specialty coffee mean? It means a differentiated experience, not just the product, right? Like for a lot of us, this has really tested us to where everything's reduced down to the coffee. It's like the cafe doesn't matter, the decorations doesn't matter, the nice music doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the coffee. It, but you know, that's not the whole, of specialty coffee right like we we expect more from these experiences so realizing that how can we have a differentiated experience in a to-go setting you know and and realizing that you know as soon as we started that the customers their reaction was again a lot like back 20 years ago when people had never seen latte art before like wow like did you do that on purpose you know, coming to our window and looking around and saying, this is amazing. Like nothing else is this safe. It makes me feel 
as a customer really safe and, and then and just to interject it came from originally the our need to protect the baristas yeah like so, they said I, we don't want anyone in our shop like they told us and because we had that relationship that they could tell us to our faces nope nick we are not going to do this unless we feel safer you know so, so in business we're always sort of faced with like three stakeholders right there's like the business ownership or like you know whoever itself there's the employees and then there's the the customer base and there's like three juggling three balls that are in the air and all of a sudden the shape and size and weight of those balls changed overnight but you know again it's like if you concentrate on the idea of like how can we keep those three balls in the air then solutions start to emerge and that's what we did that's that's really interesting so going to anna anna like i know you for years and Nick was talking about customer experience and you have always been designing customer experience like and we know that specialty coffee like we all know that it's not what is inside the cup it's the values that we represent as an industry that is outside the cup and and all these years you have been advocating for that and you have been designing experiences for consumers to to get in touch with that how or what opportunities do you see for for this uh, during this crisis for uh, for a business to transform to to get those experiences uh, design those experiences and get those values that is outside the cap? Well, um, I think we have to start as an industry uh, to think more about customers. Because usually what you see in a specialty coffee shop is like disgusting furniture, <laughs> you know, sometimes even rude baristas that think they are rock stars and that they know everything about everything and that customers are, you know, some strange people who have to just listen and pay. That's it. And um, maybe we have to change that a little bit. And I think that the uh, opportunities that we have the, the first and the foremost is that we have to realize who we are. If we are centered about the coffee and only coffee, then we have to think about the experience. How can we deliver coffee to the house? How can we teach them how to brew coffee at home and all that, those things? If we are more about the community thing, like a coffee shop where people spend time, we have to think about them. Is it convenient for them to spend time in the coffee shop? Uh, during the bad times and good times? Are they comf confident? Are they comfortable? Do they like the product? Do they need anything else uh, uh, for their experience and all that? You know, we have to, as a specialty industry, we have to grow a little bit because now we are very small and usually we are thinking of ourselves as a small business. So that's why our customers are so loyal to us. You know, they they forgive you all things that all the mess that you have you know all the you know those small things that we do they just forgive that because we give them the product and the experience but we have to look at the big ones who have been in business for like 20 years or maybe 50 years we usually know that the product is not that good there but it, they are still full you know all those businesses are packed with customers even though they cannot deliver good product especially good coffee right so maybe we have to start learning from them business practices and become not just coffee enthusiastic you know herd or something but try to become a real business because um I think that we've grown some small groups of customers that love the coffee and we've grown some small groups of customers that love our coffee shops and the, um, you know, the experience that they get. But if we talk about millions of people who usually live in the cities where we work at, they are not accustomed to that. Maybe they need something more to be able to enjoy our cup of coffee. Uh, and you know, to to my surprise, I was talking to different uh, friends, you know, now we have time to talk to friends a lot and uh, who are not in, in the coffee business. And it turned out that they, not that they love the coffee that much. Of course, they now understand that it can be more acidic or more sweet or whatever, but still they like the experience that they got 
you know they like that you know what i do they like the way i talk about it they like uh, the company itself they like you know they like some different things apart from coffee and so if we are doing uh, something for the uh, community we have to think more about community so we have to start using normal marketing tools you know we have to adapt to the digital part of all the business we have to adapt to new ways of selling our experiences even in a new environment so that's what i think is going to be happening with the business it it will become bigger and it will become more professional thank you so i think that we have reached um the the length of this webinar we are on an hour um i would like to thank you all for taking the time and and the effort to be here today uh, i understand for everybody it has been long and tough days for the last uh, couple of months so i really appreciate um all of your being here and, and your time um i would like to 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 send my wishes to alejandro mendez who was uh, supposed to be here today with us, but he had to take his father to the hospital. So um, wishes for best recovery for his father. Um, thank you for being part on this first um, uh, roundtables uh, webinar series. Uh, it has been an honor and a, and a privilege to have you here today. And stay healthy and strong. Thank you so much.